Uh, good morning. This is Tracy Enright. I'm the Executive Director of Cornerstones Community <coughs> Partnerships. This, rec this recording is being done for the history of Cornerstones. I'm currently in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm aware this is being recorded. Nancy? Worth? Good morning. I'm Nancy Arnon Agnew. I'm sitting at my desk in Topanga Canyon, California, wishing I were there, even though two degrees is coming up, Nancy Worth tells us. And it's fine with me to have this recorded. And thank you, Tracy. Sam. Yeah, Sam Baca, and I'm at my home in Santa Fe, and I am fine with the recording. Ed. Ed Crocker, I'm at home in Santa Fe, and I'm fine with the recording. Susan. <laughs> Say your name. No, I'm Susan Herter. And where you live? And I live in uh, Pojoac. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay with the recording? And I'm okay, which was the lie, because I didn't understand how you even turn on or off the recorder. That's my generation. And Nancy Worth. Hi, I'm Nancy Worth, and I'm here in <coughs> Santa Fe. And I'm just so happy that all of us are together. Um, and it's the first time we've been together with Susan. We were together uh, for the first version of this and had so much fun that we decided that it would be even more fun to have it with, with Susan. So uh, I, I thought I'm just gonna, I at first uh, just kind of would like to get a, a kind of a sense of time, the timeline of all this. And Nancy Arnon, I have just wondered if you could, if you could give us an idea about uh, when you and Susan first got together and were part of you were part of uh, the New Mexico Community Foundation. And what was what was the, the kind of the, the spark that made you all begin to think that churches, communities, as uh, symbols of community, uh, was a uh, a great idea and worthy of of hiring people and going forward maybe on our own. So Nancy, can't take that away. I'm gonna point at the person responsible. Okay, you can see my fingers, Susan Herder. And Susan, you will correct me, I know, if for all my, all my um, incorrect memories, Susan Herder in 1985, perhaps before, was chairman of the board of the New Mexico Community Foundation. Joe <laughs> Waldron was at that time a prolific painter in New Mexico. He, one of his specialties was painting the gorgeous, rounded, sensual New Mexico churches. He became more and more distraught because as he went around Rancho de Taos, especially where he was so active, El Valle uh, near um, uh, Truchas, he could see the uh, crumbling before his eyes of the churches. Of course, all of the uh, n n New Mexicans who lived in the villages who had built these churches were even more distraught. This was their, uh, uh, the, 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 these were their uh, ancestral um, centers of community, places of worship. Joe Waldrum, as I recall it, not only wrote uh, a fiery, article to the New Mexican, there not being um, internet at that time, uh, uh, describing what he was seeing and pleading for help. But as I recall, he made an appeal, uh, Susan, to your foundation, the New Mexico Community Foundation, saying, we have to do something. Now, Susan, uh, at that time, um, and her board did uh, vote approval of taking on something, some project. But of course the task was daunting. No one knew how many churches there were. Uh, uh, no one knew their condition. Uh, there was no money. Uh, the archdiocese was uh, 
probably, I can't speak from knowledge, but probably struggling just to keep up with the, the requirements of keeping their larger uh, parish churches going, much less being able to worry about the, the uh, smaller village churches. The New Mexico Community Foundation hired, um, actually, Susan, you were the one who found her and, and hired her, I believe, uh, Susanna Aldi, whom I think all of us know, except possibly you, Tracy, uh, to come in and write a grant to the National Endowment for the uh, Arts. To, it, it was a planning grant to get money with which to begin to um, lay out a plan for working with the churches. Susanna and Bruce Rolstadt, the uh, director of the foundation at the time with Susan's help wrote this grant and uh, Susanna Aldi recently emailed me when I was asking her more about that time. She said Susan and actually hand carried that grant to the National Endowment for the Arts. I think Susan, you had a friend there, Adele Chatfield Taylor, my timing may be a little off there. And, and the grant was funded. And may I add in parenthesis, that was the first of many grants we got from the National Endowment for the Arts. So what Once, year was that, Nancy? Excuse me for interrupting. I believe it was funded in, uh, the word came in early 1986. Now, Susan and her foundation had a pot of money with which to proceed. <laughs> I was, I can remember where I was sitting at the time. I was sitting um, in a rocking chair in my tiny little casita at Herman Barkman's, Susan, um, the, oh, yeah. the, the Barkman's, when the phone rang and it was Susan. And she, I had met Susan at a St. John's College seminar. I didn't know her well. And she said, well, she said, I would like to, uh, uh, Susan's very diplomatic. She didn't want to say, I want to offer you the job of being director because she really didn't know me well enough to do that. But she said something like, I was wondering if this might be of interest to you if it should turn out that um, in fact, we would consider hiring you as a director. So, and then Susan said, I'm going to pick you. I said, I, I was over the moon. And then she said, all right, well, I'm gonna pick you up at such and such a time on Sunday and you and I are going to go to mass at Las Trampas. And I didn't realize it, but I was being looked over by Susan <laughs> to kind of see if, um, I, I, you know, uh, get, get a sense of um, how things might work out. I don't know if you remember that, Susan. We went up on some cold um, spring day in 1986 to mass at Las Trampas. It was very beautiful. And um, months later, as it turned out, because of other things that were happening in my life, I did become director, but uh, that was kind of a paltry skeleton staff. There was Susan, the chairman of the board. There was Bruce Rolstadt, the director of the next community foundation, and there was me, and that was it. Well, Susan had friends at the Petroleum Building. Do you remember that office, Susan? It was down around Guadalupe and Cerrillos. And they said to Susan, I hope I'm not being too, this is really long-winded, Trace. Uh, Nancy, I can, let me be, a, I, I am such a rambler. Let me just cut to the chase and be a little more synoptic. So we, anyway, Bruce, Susan, and I reported for work every day at, at that, uh, at their boardroom, but we were told, leave the whole boardroom and the whole uh, annex of this building um, invisible to your presences in the evening when we have our own business to do there. So every day, Nancy, this has to do with why it was so wonderful getting an office from you. We had to take our stapler, our scotch tape, our papers, put them on trays and stuff them in the bathroom cabinets every <coughs> night. So no one would know we were there. During the day, Susan was amazing because she was in fact um, our a uh, source of inspiration and ideas. She called Bruce and me the kiddies. So we would meet every day and she'd say, okay, kids, you know, we're gonna decide what we're going to do today. And, and, and the plan we came up with was to write a grant for many more funds. We, Susan, I do wanna say, 
what I learned so much from you about management and fundraising and what I will never forget, and then I'll stop because I'm just so wordy. But Susan, we had written a grant to a, a letter of an interest to the Skaggs Foundation. And we got a letter back from Philip Jelly saying, I'm sorry, we're really not interested in New Mexico churches. We're too busy with California missions. And I was extremely deflated because we had thought they were a good match. And you said, Susan, you said, well, you sit right down at your typewriter and you fire off a letter saying, if you're ever in New Mexico, Mr. Jelly, we would love to give you a tour of our churches. <laughs> so we did that. And a few months later, we got a letter from Philip Jelly saying, I'm coming, I want my tour. And once he had seen the churches talk to people in communities, he then, as I mentioned in our last session, he gave us the first of many, many grants. That's just an example of where Susan, <clears throat> I learned from you, wouldn't have occurred to me to go back to someone who turned us down in effect and and, and open more doors. Um, as the monies came in, we could hire more staff. And I did talk about that last time and I've taken up way too much time. So I'm gonna, as a friend of mine says, zip the lip. No, every word, every word you say, Nancy, is wonderful. Now I wanna hear from, well, was Sam the first person that you, that you hired? Sam, can you, uh, can you carry on from there? Sure. Yeah, I was, and Nancy told the story about the cryptic ad in the New Mexican that I responded to <laughs> with no idea of what, what the program was. Um, but I got a very good um, orientation to what it uh, was all about from Susan and Nancy. That was kind of my job interview at, in the office at, at uh, on Guadalupe Street. And um, when they described to me what the whole uh, concept of the program was, and it just really... I really um, got to me and I just, I thought, well, I definitely want to do this. And um, so I, I jumped right in and it was, it was so funny because we were so cramped in the little tiny office there in, on Guadalupe Street. I had a desk kind of in the middle of the, of the lobby, I guess, or what the kind of big part of the office. And um Susan kind of had a desk there and would would be there pretty often and that was really cool because I would um, I, I had a chance to really kind of um, well we had we had a kind of a team going the three of us and uh, um, I was hired as community coordinator can every can anybody else hear that echo yes yeah uh, okay I don't know what that's all about but um, at any rate um, I, um, I was hired as community coordinator. And so that what year was, was that? that was 80, gosh, what was it? I think it was kind of the end of 86 or early 87. It was pretty early on. And I remember that we had a grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I think that was part of what funded my uh, position. And um, my first, uh, assignments as community coordinator was actually to go out into the, some of the communities that we were, that we had um, kind of known that there was issues with the churches and make contacts in the community and start to, to um, the, before we had a services to offer, um, we were basically working on, on uh, with volunteers. Ed was uh, already working on the uh, project in, La, in Rociada when I came on. And I believe already we were just starting the project in Chacon. I think there were our first two projects where we were really able to do a lot of hands-on work. Initially, a lot of what I was doing was the, uh, what we call preservation plans. And um, uh, we had, there had just been a survey of historic churches by uh, the Johnson Nestor architectural firm. They had done a survey of all of the historic churches in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, uh, which was uh, commissioned, I believe, by Archbishop Sanchez at the time. And, the, and kind of concurrently with Church of Symbols of Community, the Archdiocese formed a, um, a commission for the preservation of historic churches. But at any rate, the, the survey was really an important tool for, uh, for us because it categorized the churches into three categories. Um, 
number one churches were, were parish churches with a resident pastor, active um, parishes. Number two churches were churches that were still used, but only they were missions. They were missions of the uh, of the uh, parish church, and were only, that would have mass maybe once a month, if that, and uh, special occasions like funerals or, or weddings. Category three churches were churches that were no longer in use at all. Most and some of them abandoned and and pretty much falling apart, as in Pajarito, for example. So um, we made the decision, we made the, the conscious decision to focus on number two and number three churches only. Uh, number one churches were the responsibility of the, of the archdiocese. And we, I believe it, it, occasionally we would go out and, and, and uh, um, take a look at a church and, and possibly consult. And by, by we, I don't, I, I mean our volunteer architects and, and volunteers like Ed. Um, so uh, the, the initially what our deliverable that were to the National Trust, I believe, right? I, I, I think that's right, Nancy. We had to do a video, which we did. And, you know, I, I searched for that video in preparation for our last meeting and I couldn't find it. I went to the office and I couldn't find the video, but it, it, ex it exists somewhere. Um, but then also preservation plans. And so we would, uh, some of the architects uh, like Jake and uh, Jake Rodriguez, Victor Johnson, Barbara Zook, of course, um, were uh, some, Ed Masria was, uh, did a preservation plan, I remember. So, uh, but on a volunteer basis, they would, they would go out take a look at the church and, and actually come up with a, with a preservation plan. Those were initially what we did. But it was, I believe, 89 when we, when we finally got the Skaggs grant that Nancy talked about. And, that's, and by that time, Ed had been a, almost a full-time volunteer at every Saturday at work days um, at Rociada and at, and at Chacon and in a, a, probably a couple of other churches by 89. Um, but that's the Skaggs grant, I believe, is when we were able to hire Ed. And uh, I, I'll, I'll just, I distinctly remember when that decision was made. It was Nancy, Susan, and myself that had gone up to Canjilon to look at the, the, the church up there, which was in bad shape. We stopped at a, at a, um, a bench kind of on, you know, there was a little kind of a rest area there off of the highway. And we talked about, um, uh, you know, and Susan and Nancy kind of made the decision that this, you know, we can we can uh, try to see if, if uh, Ed would come work with us full time. And, and sure enough, he did. And boy, that's when everything just took off. By then, um, we had been out in the communities enough to where people had, had word had gotten out that there was this organization that could kind of, that could help you with the restoration of your church, and that's the one thing that really um, came came out to me was that um, in in talking to the dedication, the love that that people had for their churches, and and you know it, it really represented a connection to their past. It was the work of their ancestors. Um, they you know they were built by the by the people by the grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents of the people in the communities. And then the succeeding generations had taken on the traditions of, of um, coming together and for the remudding of the church. And so um, you know that that was what really uh, spoke to me the most was the dedication of people, the, the love that they had for the churches and what they were willing to do. You know, we would we would always um, make it really clear to a community that we don't come in and do a project for you. You have to provide the 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 manpower for it, and you know we can we can offer help with you know the planning of the project and in and the implementation. One of the greatest things was the ability when once we had raised enough money to be able to buy scaffolding, to buy mixers, to buy the equipment. We even had a, a, a Toyota truck that was donated to us. Um, 
for uh, the, um, and, and then eventually we were able to hire Steve Peart as a second technical um, advisor and, and help, you know, helping to, to coordinate projects. So by the, by 19, by the time uh, nine, the nineties came along, we were involved in multiple projects at the same time, which was really great. And uh, I don't want to ramble on too much either. I, I, Ed can, can probably uh, talk more about, uh, about those early projects. Yeah, but before, Ed, Ed before, you, before you talk to us, because I really want to hear what you have to say, I want to ask Susan a question. Susan. Nancy, can I jump in for just a second? I think that echo is coming from feedback out of your own speakers. If you're comfortable with the mute button and you're not speaking and you can mute your microphone, um, that should help. Part of it is that Sam has a really great resident voice, but um, if the mute button is difficult, I don't want to um, mess up the flow of the conversation, but if you're comfortable working the mute button and you can turn it on, when you're not speaking, turn it, well, turn your microphone off via the mute button. That would help. That's a, that's a good idea, yeah. Okay, Susan, I just wanted to know, I think, I, I remember that the artist's name was Harold Joe Waldrum. And I wondered where, if, if do you have, do you have one of his paintings? And if not, I wonder if, if there's a way for Cornerstones to get one of his paintings. Do you have one, Susan? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Do you have one of um, uh, Waldrum's, Harold Joe Waldrum's paintings? One of those early, remember those early kind of yellow paintings that he did of the churches? Um, gee, I need, I need help answering that. What do you think, Nancy? Uh, it's me, what do you think? Um, well, was his, first of all, was his, was his name Harold, Harold Joe Waldrum? I'm sorry? Was his name Harold Joe Waldrum or was it just plain Joe? Oh, it was nothing. I don't know. I don't know. If I can jump in, um, I think you're absolutely right, Nancy, Harold Joe Waldrum. And before the, we had this last conversation, I did Google him, being curious oh, about great. him. And there's a long Wikipedia article about him. I think it even has, and, and one can also easily get, I uh, uh, see his some of his paintings online, and they, and I think it was in the Wikipedia article that they mentioned where his paintings are still extant or collected. I think you know Museum of New Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. That's my recollection, Susan. But you know that that was your your specialty back then. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, well, I'm sorry to be um, our crying. The uh, ones who were of, of great help today are, of course, um, no idea. Go, Simma. <laughs> But you don't. But I just. Do you have? Do you have a a Waldrum painting in your in your house? No. Wouldn't don't you think it would be fun to have for cornerstones if we could get a reproduction or something of of one of his paintings to have down in the office? You. Everybody else talk. I can't do it. Can I just say one thing about Joe Waldron? Um, I can't remember what year it was, but um, we one of the fundraisers that we decided to do um, was an art sale. Um, we had several art, really some pretty well-known artists, including Joe Waldron, um, 
to donate paintings that we and, and we would have we had that it was kind of like an art auction or not really an auction an art sale at our the historic um uh, santuario de guadalupe and um harold joe waldron we did it about three years in a row i think uh the the art sale we had artists like elias rivera um uh, carol anthony um Harold Joe Waldron, some pretty well-known artists and, and the paintings sold for, for a good price and we made quite a bit of money. Bill Murphy was the person that put it together. Bill oh, yeah. was, an, yeah, he was, he passed away sometime, some years ago, but he retired in Santa Fe. He was a <coughs> cartoonist, I believe, for like the New Yorker or one of, you know, the big East, East Coast publications. Um, but anyway, um, Harold Joe Waldron uh, would always donate one of his great um, paintings for the art auction. And, um, and so uh, that, I just wanted to, to, to bring that up as in terms of, and, and I do remember his name was Harold Joe Waldron, right? Well, uh, one thing that has that nobody else had, luckily, uh, was uh, how Joe's somewhat round in shape, and he liked this painting, although he didn't like he made, he made his own paintings of uh, Zeus's, and they were easily recognizable if you do um, but you had to be <laughs> a little careful because we didn't let everybody in. How <laughs> uh, smart did everybody but all their their painters uh, and sculptors uh, was very hard in house, and they also did in uh, throughout the this between house and here. Um, I'm sorry to be so out of uh, language myself, but that's because. Uh, We had we had the uh, Taos had the um, what do they call that Taos at the show? Well, anyway, they're concentrated in a way that makes them very uh, expandable, and um, on the other hand, you don't want to keep writing the exhibitions about the same exhibition of the same artist and uh, oh we even got as far as uh, some time some space and uh, what's the word Ah. I'm gonna pass on this. I'm just, it's just not coming to. Me. Okay. Well, then we'll 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 get Ed to talk a little bit about his early days at at, at Rosiada and uh, the the wonderful work that he's he all the places where he went and worked in the early days. Okay, Ed. Of course, and there were a great many of those places, as Sam has already indicated. Uh, and it is true, the first, it, kind of in a similar story of Susan uh, taking Nancy up to Las Trampas for mass, I remember Nancy Arnon taking me to mass in Chacon on an absolutely horrible, miserable winter's day, which I believe was 1986 probably late 1986. 
Um, she had just kind of sucker punched me by approaching me when I was working at the San Juan de Guadalupe, stabilizing the bell tower. And she just walked up to me and said, well, it looks like you might know something about Adobe. And I said, no, not really. Um, and she said, well, it looks like it. So I'm wondering if you would be interested in um, just joining us. This is our organization, just joining us to take a look at, at a church up in northern New Mexico. Um, sure, why not, I thought. So we did that. We drove up there. We met Mary Romero and, and Jerry Romero and her father, Don Pedro Aveta. And uh, the church was indeed in pretty grim shape, not as bad as Rociada, whose wall one of which walls had already collapsed. And like Sam, I was just utterly taken by the integrity of the people that were wanting to have their churches repaired. And as we spoke last time, I mean, they really were and are symbols of community, places of worship, uh, and great historic structures that tell a story like no other architecture. It's um, truly amazing what those churches, especially in aggregate, what story they tell. Well, one thing led to another. The next project that I worked on was at Upper Rociala, and Sam and I, of course, have lots of big laughs about Upper Rociala. Uh, we went up there on uh, December 23rd, I think 1986. Am I right, Sam? Anyway, I think I'm right. And uh, they had a collapsed wall, and we drove up there with scaffolding and lumber and all the rest of it. And when we got there, the, the Mayordomo, Ted Martinez, and, and his brother and his nephew and a number of other people were standing there kind of like, well, who are these guys? What are they doing in our church? They were kind of leaning against some of the still standing walls and looking a little bit doubtful about who we might be. And, you know, we started hauling stuff in, hauling the scaffold again to support the roof and just went to work. Everybody, they all knew some carpentry. They didn't know anything about Adobe, but they all could do some carpentry. And we weren't using steel scaffolding at that time or, or shoring, it was all wooden. So we all worked together very well. And from that moment on, uh, we were really kind of an institution in Upper Rociada. We spent an awful lot of time up there. And one of the great things that resulted from that was Antonio Martinez became totally interested in the churches and uh, went on to become a long-term volunteer with us and was actually uh, late, you know, quite a bit later on, was hired by the archdiocese as kind of the overseers uh, of the churches, kind of doing a circuit writer kind of thing. Well, it went on and on um, from Rociada, I think we, we got started on the church in La Cueva, uh, Nancy Arnon. You might remember that as you were married in that church, as was I. <laughs> yes, indeed. After we were restored. Um, so, the, so the meaning of these buildings just keeps getting layered and layered and layered. Um, it was a little bit later than that, that we got Pat Taylor involved down in Las Cruces and started doing the work on the Doniana Church. And that went on also for a number of years. And of course that spread out to a number of churches in the Southern, the Southern part of the state. Um, one very memorable uh, event that I recall, and Sam will have to tune in on this, was that Sam and I were invited after we had done the rest, helped with the restoration of uh, the Morada in Los Gueros, which is way, it's up near uh, Ocate. They invited us to Holy Thursday services. The brothers did, the hermanos did. Uh, I learned a couple of things about Sam that night. And one was that he did not speak the Spanish of Cervantes because the hermanos prayers were all being said in this archaic 16th century Spanish. Uh, but we had a fabulous time anyway. Um, and we, we got out of the service, Sam, I'm gonna guess probably about 9.30, something like that. And on our way driving back, we were 
hit by an elk. Sam did not hit the elk. I can absolve him of that. The elk hit him. We were driving in his little Chevy car and it made a mess of his car, it crushed in the, the right front and broke the windshield, shattered. And you know what windshields look like when they're, you know, they just like you're looking through crystal, just, you know, all fragmented. The elk was on the side of the road. Uh, I was going to um, see if I could put it out of its misery with my Swiss army knife, certainly that I couldn't, but somebody from the local community came by and uh, I think it wound up in his freezer. Anyway, Sam and I crept into Las Vegas, bought a big bottle of gin and then crept our way back to Santa Fe. Sam, I want you to comment on that. A memorable evening with the, the hermanos. Oh my gosh. Yeah, um, well, you know, the, the, the vehicle that Ed's talking, the guy that, that Ed's talking about, actually he had his brights on. And I think that was what, uh, that's certainly what, what blinded me from seeing the elk com, uh, coming from our left. And um, uh, Ed also freaked out the, the, uh, the elk to kind of leap uh, right into us and fr fortunately over us. But at any rate, um, it was that same guy who, uh, you know, Ed had gotten out of, of his vehicle and he asked the guy, "Do you have a Do you have a rifle? Do you have that we can put this poor animal out of its misery?" And the guy said, "No, but uh, he was coming from Ojo Feliz. He was heading north, and uh, he 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 said, no, but I can get it real quick." And so he yeah. got back into his truck and went and got his rifle. And like Ed said, I'm sure the deer ended up in the elk, a, a good sized elk ended up in his freezer. But anyway, we, we uh, <laughs> as Ed said, um, you know, I hate, uh, th this is something I hate to admit it in, in these days of, <laughs> of uh, um, open container laws, but uh, we needed something to calm our nerves. And, but the, the drive back to, to, uh, to, to Santa Fe was un unbelievable because I was, you know, Ed talked about the shattered um, windshield. I was looking through what little uh, um, uh, you know and every vision night that I had out of there. a thousand times so. and we drove probably about 30 miles an hour all the way back to Santa Fe we did make it to Santa Fe that night uh, that or I should say early that next morning because it, it, I'm literally we were driving at about 30 miles an hour on the shoulder of the road for the most part <laughs> So anyway, a very memorable night. But that was um, the, the, the service that we went to was Tinieblas. It was a Holy Thursday service and it was just beautiful and amazing. And also extremely rare that uh, the hermanos would ever invite any outside um, people to their, to their services, which was a testament to how they felt about what we had done there in terms of this, the help that we had offered them in restoring the old morada. Um, and then in another a year later, or two years later, they actually allowed us to, to bring uh, Joe Emmons, who was um, from the Graham Foundation in Colorado, who um, Joe was, um, Joe Emmons had provided a lot of the funding that helped restore the Morada and, and other uh, buildings. So the um, we went up a second time. You were involved in that second trip too, weren't you, Ed? With no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. You weren't, okay. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, so well, that's... I went, I went uh, to, uh, on one of those uh, things because the one time that I've ever been in a morada uh, for a, a, I think it was, a, it wasn't Good Friday, but it was it was Thursday, Monday, Thursday. In Yevlas, probably, Holy Thursday. Yes, that's what, and I can remember how uh, my knees, John was with me, and my, I found it really hard to be on my knees all that, all that time <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I'd like to ask you guys, what, what do you think the funniest moment was that, that, during those early days that you can remember? <laughs> I'm not sure hitting the elk was very funny. <laughs> That might have qualified for me, <laughs> although yeah. it didn't seem <laughs> <Pretty much laughs> me too. It, it didn't it didn't seem that funny at the time. <laughs> no. I have two um, tiny little um, silly moments, Nancy. The first one was as I emailed 
you, Tracy, I think, or Nancy, for a while, um, the New Mexico Community Foundation was homeless. This was after you, I, I think, Susan, were not chairman. And Bruce Rolstadt, the director, through his connection with the First Presbyterian Church, uh, was granted permission to use the childcare room that they used to take care of toddlers and other children on a Sunday service. And so trying to balance no computers, a huge blue Selectrics typewriter on top of these crumbling cardboard children's building bricks whilst sitting in a child's plastic chair. And now and then the whole uh, enterprise would collapse into my lap. And then of course it had to all be packed up Friday so the children could come in. I think we were just laughing um, the entire day, work day there as we stumbled over little wheeled um, policemen's uh, uniform carts, that, that kind of thing. That, that was a ludicrous phase of the, of the church's project. I would also say that I got some completely unfair and unwarranted flack from Susan and Sam and probably from you, Crocoronius, about A, my driving and B, the, the decrepit <laughs> Uh, beat up vehicles that I had. And anytime uh, uh, some uh, uh, foundation director would come and need a tour, Susan would say, well, just keep Nancy Arnon away from them. Don't let them get near her car. Don't let them get near their driving. <laughs> and Sam said, which I have always remembered, Sam, you said in hot protest, you said, well, I don't know why everyone's complaining about Nancy's driving. She's fine when she stays on the road. <laughs> I've never, I've never forgotten that, that, that line. And, and Susan still, I think, gives me flack in, in that department. Um, so, th so those are two, two, two memories that, that, that stand out, I, I would say, Susan. I, it, it reminds me of, a, of, of another funny moment in, the, in those early days. If I think somebody, if, if everybody the mutes, you won't have the echo. Yeah. Um, so anyway, in those, we, I, I just remember Nancy, with, in those early days, Nancy spent a lot of her time writing grants for, for new funding. And um, one of those grants, I, I always remember, um, right going right up to the deadline of having to deliver the grant it had to be postmarked on that day and I can remember driving to the uh, there was a, um, a FedEx uh, thing at, uh, at the De Vargas Mall I can remember driving and getting there they would close at five o'clock and I remember getting there at two minutes till five but one particular time we had to deliver a, um, a proposal to the SHPO the State Historic Preservation Office and I remember having to, to, to um, normally Nancy would walk that over, but we were there, we were, had about three minutes left before the deadline. And so I, I had, we hopped in my car, I, I sped through downtown Santa Fe, <laughs> dodging cars and getting, to, getting Nancy to the SPO at exactly one minute till five. And, and Nancy making that, uh, delivering that proposal with about maybe 10 seconds to spare. <laughs> you remember that, Nancy? Sam, you bring back a host of memories. I remember racing on slippery sidewalks that were iced over to the um, Santa Fe post office, which used to be you know, a couple blocks away uh, as you uh, got on the highway north. And uh, with five minutes to 12 p.m. And I remember one night I arrived at the back door, it was locked of course, and usually I would knock and, and the postal employees were so nice. They would come and even if it was two minutes after midnight, they would stamp it you know, with their hand stamp, you know, postmark the, the required day. And I knocked and there was no answer. And I thought all of this work, you know, we, they, won't even, they won't even let the grant in its door if it's not postmarked correctly. 
correctly. And I remember yelling through, you know, snowflakes falling um, uh, at the bed, hammering at the back door. And finally, finally, some uh, sound of the key in the door, you know, this is the old days. And some employee uh, who looked as though he had a nice nap. Uh, in the meantime, kind of grudgingly opened the door. And when I explained the problem, he took a stamp and set the dial so that it would read midnight of the day and stamped it down. So, so it was a close call. Um, you're quite right. It's called brinksmanship, Arnonymous. Brinksmanship. Called procrastination, Crocker. Yes, that too. <laughs> Most people. But you know, Susan, you were uncanny because I would be working away, um, you know, 11 p.m. in Nancy, worse, beautifully um, uh, presented office to us, which was a paradise on Otero. And at 10.30, before you went, you somehow knew I was there, knowing I was a procrastinator. And you would call me and you'd say, well, dear, how's it going? And I would report in, you'd say, well, that a girl. Onward and upward. That was your your standard phrase, and and I just it just warmed my heart that you were the cheering team um, behind those grants. So I thank you for that. Decades later. Well, some names some names have have emerged, uh, and uh, for instance, Antonio Martinez. Does anybody know what what he's up to these days? Sam? I um, I don't. I know that he had a stroke about five years ago oh. that I think limited his mobility to some degree. Uh, I haven't seen him probably in three or four years since right after the stroke. Sam, do you know something? No, I, I, I ran into his sister, um, Anna. Um, she, I, I ran into her and it's, that's already been a couple years ago and I asked her how he was doing. And he, it, it, the recovering from the stroke was was pretty difficult. It was, and and um, it sounded like was kind of protracted. Um, but he uh, he still had his apartment uh, here in Santa Fe, off of St. Francis Drive. He he had kept that apartment and then would would uh, you know travel back and forth from Rosada. And then the, uh, you know he was a school teacher until he retired several years back. Um, and so he'd always have his summers off, and that's where we really were able to to um, make use of his of his time. We hired him uh, to to manage projects over the summer. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm not sure, um, you know how I, I haven't I haven't heard anything other than the last thing I heard was from his sister, and that's already been at least two maybe two three years ago. The other person that I think is still around here in Santa Fe is Bruce Rolstad. Um, it would be sort of fun to catch up with him. And then, of course, Pat Taylor uh, would be wonderful to hear some stories from him. Particularly, I think it would be interesting to, to know more about our program with the youth uh, uh, and, and when we were in Doniana and uh, mm -hmm. that whole. That whole uh, segment of the organization was so strong. Yeah, yeah. You know, I um, th that that program was pretty amazing because uh, it it took place during uh, a Republican administration. It was when Gary Johnson was governor and uh, Clint Hardin was the Secretary of Labor. But we uh, we actually went to him to to develop a job training program with state funds. And uh, they, they funded it. Not only did they fund it, but they were very proud of it. They put it on the, on the cover of, or on the back cover of one of their um, annual reports. And um, it was basically a training program for a youth that had dropped out of, of school. And a lot of them were in trouble with the law. They were, these were at risk youth for sure. And um, the, the, the state provided training funds, which was minimum wage um, salary for the for the students to work uh, four days a week on the restoration of the the oldest church in the southern part of the state, the Doña Nuestra Señora de la Candelaria Church. Um, 
the one of the main uh, proponents, the community people that were interested in it was, um, uh, oh gosh, um, Mary Senator Callis. Senator. Mary, uh, Mary Jane Garcia. Uh, Mary Jane Garcia, right? Mary Jane Garcia, yeah. Senator oh, Mary yeah, Jane yeah. Garcia, yes. Um, and she uh, also helped to secure, she helped uh, make that connection with the state so that the state was actually providing the funds for the wages of the youth. And then uh, one of the conditions from being involved in the program was that they, the, uh, they would work from Monday through Thursday on, on the church, learning traditional building skills from Pat. Pat was an amazing um, director for that program. And, um, and they actually got to, to really develop relationships with all of the, the, the youth there. Um, but they, uh, Friday, they would spend in GED classes. So getting the, their GED and working towards their GED was a condition for, be, for, for getting hired in the program. And it was like a, a job for them. They were, they were earning wages and at the same time pursuing their GED. And it was, it was a... It was this um, really an amazing uh, private public private partnership that uh, that we were able to do, and Pat was really the heart of of making that successful. Yeah, I think it, it didn't sound am I right that it went back to something in Spain, and I remember the name Eduardo Saez. Asnad. Eduardo Asnad. 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 Yeah. 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 Escuelas Taller. In, exactly. Yeah, Ed, you probably know more about about the the, the model that, that that was kind of based on the Escuela de Ed model. Yeah, it was uh, it was developed in Spain and it was based on community involvement in the restoration of historic structures. They didn't necessarily have to be churches; they could be pretty much anything. But it was a uh, a program developed for at risk youth, similarly, and also just people who wanted to learn about historic preservation, young people, I think it was like 15 to 26 or something like that was the age parameter. And at one point, Anne and I uh, visited the Escuela Taller in Spain with Eduardo Asnad as our guide. And it was a fabulous experience. And since then I have visited uh, the Escuela Talleres in, in Mexico and in Guatemala. I mean, it became a worldwide thing. And we very much wanted to emulate that and in a large way did, but Escuelas Taller was government funded. So they had pretty much unlimited funds, which we did not. But they, they, they taught things like masonry, as I remember. And then didn't that fit in really well, uh, Ed, with what you were doing at Zuni Pueblo? Very much so, yeah. The, the project in, in Zuni was centered almost entirely around stone masonry. And it started uh, actually on the Adobe Church, uh, which had been restored in 19, but and the restoration ended in 1970, but had since suffered from some serious defects from the, from the restoration, the Viga tails were rotted. And we got a call from the tribe uh, to, come down and do an assessment of the Vigas and of the church. And that was how we got started in Zuni and that exploded into a, basically a six year program, uh, three of which I lived in Zuni. Um, and it was all based on, yeah, stone masonry, uh, the cutting, I mean, the quarrying, the cutting, the dressing, the laying of stone. And it was a very successful program. And we ran a lot of kids through that program. Uh, the you know, the, the good news about it is that Middle Village changed from a hodgepodge of uh, corrugated metal and cinder block and that kind of thing to all, all the buildings around the historic plaza having stone facades. So it's, it, brought, it brought Middle Village back to pretty much its deserved appearance. But the bad news is that uh, the, we had not really arranged for the kids that came out of that program to have jobs. And I, uh, it hurts to this day that we hadn't thought ahead and had ways of getting, of getting them into the mainstream of employment, but we didn't. Terrible lesson, but a lesson learned. Well, that, but it really does show how uh, both at Doniana and Zuni, we were working with young people 
And mm -hmm. I personally think that's that uh, uh, is something that Cornerstones could maybe do again, I think would be mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful. But you know, we've, we have talked almost for an hour and it seemed like about five minutes, but I think we be probably need to wind this up. And most of all, Susan, I just wanna say thank you for being the inspiration for this, for this gathering. It's really fun to see you. And uh, we'll have, you and I will have many vi visits, but uh, maybe, maybe this Zoom thing could work for you uh, in other ways too, I hope so. You know, Nancy, maybe I, I, I would like to close it up. Well, Susan, we, I, I just had a little uh, uh, story that I wanted to tell that involved Susan and I, that I think will bring back some very uh, uh, <laughs> fond memories for Susan. Um, Susan involved, um, one of the, the most important relationships that we had was with Eugene Thaw, who was a friend of Susan's and who, she got to fall in love with the, the historic churches in New Mexico. So he actually was able to, to facilitate a lot of relationships with other foundations and had kind of adopted us and, and um, you know, as, as something that he was very interested in through, through Susan. So he was talking to Susan uh, one day and said, you know, the Getty, um, the Getty ought to give us money. And I know Harold, Harold Brown, I believe was his name. I believe, I know Harold Brown, the head of the, the Getty. So I'm gonna arrange a meeting with Harold Brown for, uh, and, he, and he did with Susan and myself. And if you recall, Susan, he told us, uh, meet me at, he had a, a private jet that he owned in, uh, with, along with Jerry uh, Peters, I believe. And uh, he, so he told Susan and I, I have a three o'clock meeting in, uh, in um, you know, there at, at their offices in Malibu. Um, I have a three o'clock meeting with Harold Brown and I want you and Sam to, to uh, you know, to uh, you, Sam and I to, to meet with Harold Brown. So he told us to meet him at the Santa Fe airport. Um, and he had, his, he had his jet ready. This is at noon on, <laughs> On, on the same day of the meeting, of, the, of our three o'clock meeting. And he said, and don't eat lunch. And so we, Susan and I, aboard the plane with him. It's a little Learjet and the, the four of us are sitting in this incredible Learjet. Um, he had sandwiches for us. Um, we flew to Santa Monica Airport. He had a, a driver pick us up at the Santa Monica Airport, take us over to um, um, a coffee shop in Beverly Hills, where we planned our meeting with Harold Brown. We went to meet with him at three o'clock. Our driver took us over there. We had a, an hour meeting with, with Harold Brown and we made our case for, for you know, the Getty funding that, you know, by, by then we were cornerstones. And, um, and then we get back um, in the car, drive back to the Santa Monica airport, fly into Santa Fe, on our way back, we, we had wine and cold lobster. Do you remember, Susan? <laughs> and talked about our meeting with Harold Brown. So uh, we, we land at the Santa Fe airport uh, at about 6 p.m. I, I drive back home in time for, for dinner at, at, at home. So that was our little jet set experience. And Susan, do you remember that? Yes. How could you forget it? <laughs> That's a great story, Sam. I, Tracy, it's important for, I think, Sam and Ed and I, for you to know how vital the um, angels of the program have been. And you're looking at, in my view, we've had so many of them, but the two main ones, Susan and Nancy. And I can't imagine Cornerstones, the church is having done what it did without them. It, they gave us the leaven and, and the encouragement and the advice and continuous, continuous assistance in, in a mirrored forms. And how can one ever properly say thank you enough? So thank you to bo both, both of you. And, and I would like to just add a footnote, someone that we have kind of overlooked in talking about old friends, and that's Barbara Zook. Exactly. We, we really, we, she played a huge important role, even at one point being executive director of the program. 
uh, and just committed a tremendous amount of time and love and dedication uh, to the program and to the communities. So let her be remembered in this as well. And she's still around, still working, doing well. I see yep. her now and then. She was amazing. I'm so glad you said that, Ed. She would come in every Saturday uh, and uh, and more hours even than that after her other full-time job uh, to volunteer for the inventory or what, whatever. And just a wonderful, um, warm, uh, spirit as well as tremendous capabilities as a historic architect. Uh, I know we're closing, but I just want to say quickly, one of the many wonderful things she did was write a letter of recommendation for Frank and Bernie Lopez, who were the Meyer Domos of Las Trampas, uh, for a, an award from the National Historic Preservation. I think it was a White House award for outstanding American citizens who have added to the um, cultural life of our nation. Uh, they were chosen and they boarded a plane to go to the award ceremony. I think it was in, uh, in Ohio somewhere and they had never been on a plane and their son and the whole family and some of the uh, uh, Las Trampas, uh, if I said creatures, I meant Las Trampas, um, community members came down to Albuquerque Airport to photograph them leaving. They took photographs of eating their meals on the plane. They took photographs of receiving the award. They made an album of this whole trip. Uh, it meant so much to them. Barbara Zook was, without her, it, it wouldn't have happened. It, it's just one of, once of many, many examples of her dedicated service. And you too, Crocker, gave so many hours of volunteer service. The um, uh, 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 heavenly notary has noted that somewhere in your records. <laughs> okay, well, how about, how about maybe in the months to come, we, we have a, a larger Zoom and, and, we get, uh, and we get Barbara Zook and Pat Taylor and Bruce Rolstad uh, to join us and, and continue the conversation. If, if that would, I don't know if Tracy is interested in in that much history, but uh, it would be fun for us. <laughs> Memories. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I just wanted to thank you all for your time. Am I off mute? Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if I was still muted. Um, and I, I just loved how you described it, Nancy, as the angels of um, Cornerstones. And we really do appreciate so much the work that, that everyone's done and then taking the time to, to put these stories down so we'll have them in the Cornerstones archive. So I, I've enjoyed it and I, I'm laughing because I'm sitting here taking notes, forgetting that we have all this recorded. And if I want to, I could, I could come back to the recording. But well, I hope they, you all enjoyed it as well. And Nancy Worth, thank you for setting it up. Okay, well, thank thank you to all of you. But let's call let's call Susan the Archangel. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> or or um, uh, like uh, you know, all the churches have patron saints. So maybe uh, our <laughs> patron saint. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> Do you accept La, La Patrona? Does that sound good to you, Susan? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Love to everybody, and thank you very, very, very much. It's been fun. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy. Thank uh, you. Bye-bye. Bye, Nancy. bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Susan. Bye. Or hasta luego. <laughs> hasta luego. Hasta muy pronto. <laughs> <laughs>